Hey everyone, in this video we're going to look at a few more examples of recursion. In the last video we only really looked at one example, which was the factorial method, which we went pretty in depth on. In this video we're going to look at three more examples and we're going to do them a little bit more quickly. Not going to go as fully in depth, but just see more examples of how we build a recursive function and how we're going to use it as a problem solving technique. So let's go ahead and dive into the first example. All right, the first example we'll look at is using recursion to find the sum of all of the contents of an array. Now, of course, this is something that you would most usually use a loop to do in Java, but we can use recursion instead. In fact, every time that you could use a loop to solve a problem, you could also use recursion to solve it instead. The reverse is true as well. Anytime that you could use recursion to solve a problem, you could use a loop instead. It's just that sometimes a loop is more natural of a solution and sometimes recursion is more natural of a solution. So we'll start with this kind of simple example of thinking about how to do this recursively. Now the trick with a recursion is you have to sort of like have your recursive idea. How are you going to break the problem down into sub problems? And for this one, one way of doing it is to think of it like this. We can say that the sum of an array is equal to the first item plus the sum of the rest of the array. That's sort of like the key kernel of an idea that is behind the recursive solution to this. If we want to find the sum of this entire array, all 10 items, well then we can just sort of like peel off the first item and say, let's take that item and let's add to it the sum of all of the rest of these items. And here's why it's recursive, because in defining how to find the sum of the entire array, we are saying that we're going to find the sum of this subarray consisting of all but the first item. So that's sort of our recursive case. And the base case for this, if you think about it, would be the sum of an empty array is just equal to zero. This is sort of like our key recursive idea behind this. Here we have the recursive case for when the array is not empty. We peel off the first item and add that to whatever the result is of recursively finding the sum of the rest of the array. Then our base case is if the array is empty, then we just return zero. So again, whenever you are coming up with a recursive solution, there's always sort of like one sort of like nugget of an idea that is a recursive idea that the recursive method is based on. And that's what it is here. I hope that makes sense. Let's go ahead and look at doing this with code now. So we'll go ahead and write a Java method called sum. And because arrays are actually pretty basic in Java, like they don't give you too much to work with, we'll go ahead and make this a list instead. And the list can then um, this is sort of like a super class in Java that can be filled in with link list or array list or whatever. So we'll go ahead and call it a list of integers for our numbers. Now we have our two cases. One is our base case. So we can say that if this list of numbers is empty, so if numbers.size is equal to zero, then we will go ahead and return zero. If there's nothing in the list of numbers we're supposed to be summing, then the sum has to be zero. That's our base case. Otherwise, we have at least one number inside of there. And so now in order to implement this recursive idea, we need to take the first item off. And so I'm gonna say we're gonna return the numbers at slot zero. So we can call numbers.get of zero plus the result of calling sum, which is the method we're defining, with the rest of the numbers. So this part of the list over here. And we can do that in Java by using the sublist method. So I can say numbers.sublist. Sorry, my uh, writing is getting really slanted. And sublist takes the indices that we're supposed to be using for the sublist. So we're going to pass index one as the beginning and then the size of this as the second one. For some reason, the way they do it is the first one is inclusive, so it starts at zero for the first index, but the second one is exclusive. So we're going to use the size, which in this case is 10, 
over here. So it starts at one and goes all the way up to, but not including the size. So that'll make a subarray consisting of all of these items, one through the end here. So that implements that idea. We'll have the base case and the recursive case. So let's look at this in a Java file. And here we have that. We have, like I said, this method called sum that takes in a list of numbers. If the numbers list is empty, we return zero. Otherwise, we go ahead and have the recursive case. If there's at least one item, we peel off that first item. And we say the sum of the entire list is going to be that number plus whatever the sum of the rest of the list is. And to do that, we call ourselves recursively using the sub list of numbers from one through the rest of them. So we have a few things here. We have that basic sort of like nugget of a recursive idea where to add up all of the numbers in a list, you take the first one off and add that to whatever the sum of the rest of the list is. That's the first thing. And then we have this base case here, which is necessary for the recursion to work. At some point, we have to bottom out. And in this particular scenario, we bottom out when the list of numbers is empty. And then we have our recursive case approaching that base case. So if we take one number out of the array every time, eventually it's going to be empty and we'll hit this base case here. Now in our main method, we basically just test this with the numbers one through 10. I stick them in an array and then stick them in a list and print out the sum. So if this is right, it should print out 55. So if I save and quit, I can go ahead and compile this and run it and it prints 55 so this is working this isn't the way you would normally do this in java normally you would write some you know for loop or while loop to do this but you can use recursion instead and hopefully that makes sense you always need that sort of like core recursive idea in order to start building from all right let's now turn to our second example which is checking whether a string is a palindrome or not now, if you remember, a palindrome is a word that reads the same way forwards as backwards. I don't know why I said if you remember. Maybe you've never seen this before. So, for example, the word race car is a palindrome because whether you read it forwards or backwards, you actually get the same sequence of letters. It's going forwards, it's R-A-C-E-C-A-R. -E and going backwards, it's R-A-C-E-C-A-R. -E -C -A -R. Same ways forwards or backwards. So this is another one where you would probably use a loop to do this. But of course, as you might guess, we can do this with recursion as well. And so again, it's based on sort of like a core recursive idea that we're going to use. And the recursive idea we're going to use is sort of similar to the last one where we peeled off the first number in the list, except now we're going to peel off the first and the last characters in this string and then consider the middle part of the string separately. So we're going to say that a string is a palindrome if two things are true. The first thing that has to be true is the first and last characters have to be the same. The first and last chars match. That's good. That's necessary. The other thing is if the rest of the string, the part of uh, boxed off in orange here, if the rest of the string without the first and last characters is also a palindrome. And so those two things both have to be true. So we have this sort of breaking off of a subproblem idea again, because we peeled off one of the things that has to be true, the first and last characters, and that we have it also being recursive because in defining whether a string is a palindrome, we are also saying we have to check if a string is a palindrome. The trick is that it's a smaller string, right? This string here is smaller than the original string we were given. This is sort of like the core recursive idea that's going to go into our solution to this. We're also going to need a base case, of course. The base case here is actually going to be interesting because we're going to have two base cases. We're going to have one base case be that an empty string is a palindrome, and the other one is a single letter, like just A or just X or whatever is also a palindrome. This one is going to be coming into play when we have an even length palindrome. And this one will be coming into play when we have an odd length palindrome. Because when we check all of the letters in this one, we're going to have just E by itself. 
and we're going to say any string of length one is a palindrome and any string of length zero is a palindrome too. All right, let's go ahead and look at a dot Java file where we can implement this idea. Okay, so here I have an empty method called isPalindrome that takes in a string as the argument. And the main method just reads in a bunch of strings from the user and calls this isPalindrome method on them and prints out whether the result was that it was a palindrome or that it wasn't. So what we need to do, I think, first is check our base case. So we'll go ahead and say if the string's length is less than or equal to one, then we return true. So this sort of covers the two base cases of whether the string is totally empty, in which case the length will be zero, or when the string contains but one character, in which case the length will be one. In either case, it's a palindrome, so we go ahead and return true. And then the next thing we need to check is if the end characters match. So we know that if we get past this first check, we have at least two characters in the string. And so we're gonna check the first character and the last character to see if they're the same. So I'm gonna say else if the string character at the beginning, if it is not equal to the one at the end, where, let me go ahead and, because I'm gonna have to say length a lot and it's gonna get kind of long, I'm just gonna go ahead and make a variable for this. I'm gonna say string.length and store it into a variable called size, like this to make things easier. And then I'm gonna say, if that's not equal to the character at size minus one. So that would be the last character, the one at size minus one. And so if the one at zero doesn't match the one at the end, then that means it must not be a palindrome because the first one and the last one aren't matching. So we return false in this case. This is essentially a base case as well because we don't have to recurse in this case. If we see that the first character and the last character aren't the same, then we don't have to check anything else. It's not a palindrome. But if they are the same, we're gonna carry on and we're going to do one last thing, which is to return recursively now. So if it had at least two characters and the first and the last character matched, then we need to look inwards, like we said, and check the middle part of the string. So I'm gonna return whether that middle part is a palindrome. And to do that, I'll use the substring method, sort of like we just did. And this one takes the starting index. So we're gonna start it at one now instead of zero. And it has the end index, but it's not inclusive. So I think size minus one will work here. So hopefully that makes sense. So let's go ahead and check this to make sure it actually works. I'll java c palindrome.java and then go ahead and run this program. And so if we put in our race car, it should say, yes, this is a palindrome. But if I type something wrong, like race gar, let's say, then it should say it's not. I can do what else? Madam, I'm Adam. That's a famous one. Uh, we didn't put in to ignore spaces and punctuation, so it's not gonna do that. All right, so I think this is working. Let's look one more time real quick at how this is functioning. So again, we're going to have the situation where we have our stack and we're going to have a stack frame for main and that's going to call this is palindrome function. All right, just is pal. And at first it passes in for the string, the whole thing. So race car. Then when we recursively are calling ourselves, what we're doing is we're checking first if it's empty or length one, in which case we'll return true, but in this case it's not. Then we check if this first character matches the second character. And if it doesn't, we return false, but these do match and so we carry on. And so we're going to recursively call ourselves with ace ka in this case. And then in this version of the ispal method, we check if we're empty and we're not. Then we check if the endpoints match, and they do, so we carry on. And in the next version of ispal, we're going to be passing CEC. Here again, we check if this is empty or length one, and it's not. We check if our endpoints match, and in this case, they do. If they didn't, like when we put in race gar, it would have seen that they don't match and return false out of here, giving us a wrong answer. But as we said, this isn't happening in this particular instance. So we carry on and we call ispal one last time, 
where we put in just the E. And here it's going to hit that base case because it's length one. And so this one's going to return back true. And now because of the way we coded this, where it says this version of is palindrome is returning what the next version. So uh, it's kind of kind of an important point here is pal if we just did something like this, it wouldn't have worked because we need to say whatever is palindrome returns for the interior one we're returning to. So coming back to look at the stack here, this true that gets returned back into the version of is pal that called us, it gets passed along. And so this one returns true as well. And then this one returns true and this one returns true. So that main can see that when it checked if the entirety of the string race car is a palindrome, it gets the answer true back for that. So hopefully that one makes sense. I feel like there's a certain elegance that recursion has where, you know, it takes it just a little bit of cleverness to kind of like see the idea. But once you do, I feel like it really, hopefully at least to you all as well, makes sense and is kind of a neat idea. We're going to look at one more example in this video, which is the Towers of Hanoi. And I think to understand the Towers of Hanoi, it might make more sense if I go to one of the many online game versions of Towers of Hanoi so you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so here is a version of Towers of Hanoi on the website mathisfun.com, which is cool. Um, this is a very classic puzzle game. You can buy like physical versions of these that have like wooden discs and wooden towers and things that you can like try to play it in real life. But this is a virtual one. And in this game, you have these three towers, which are represented by these red pole kind of things. And you have some number of discs. In this one, you can make it more or less. We'll stick with four for right now. And your goal is to get all four of these discs from this first tower over here, all the way over to this third tower. But the trick is that you can only place a ring on top of a ring that is bigger. So if I move this one over here, I can't move disc two on top of that one. It won't let me. So you can't create a situation like this where the discs are inverted. You always have to have them going biggest at the bottom up to smallest. So the solution to this problem involves kind of shuffling the discs around a little bit, little by little as you go, sort of like this and then moving this one here, and then maybe this one here, this one here, to get this one over to where it needs to go, and then this one, and then this one, and then finally we're done. And it looks like that's the minimum number of moves that you can make for four discs. Of course, you could do more moves than that, but you couldn't do it in any less. And so what we want to do is we want to write a program to come up with the solution for us. What disks do we move where? You know, I could have done this in a non-optimal way, like maybe moving this over here, and then moving this here, and then moving this here, and then moving this here, and moving this here, and this here. You know, we could obviously have sort of messed up the puzzle and taken more time than necessary. So we want to write a program that comes up with the optimal solution to this puzzle. And so in order to come up with a solution to this, what we're going to have to do is sort of think about what has to happen for us to solve this problem. So, so let, me, let me start with like this. We want to move all of these four disks from tower one over here to tower three. But in order for that to happen, we have one very important thing to do, which is to get the bottom disk in place. That's sort of in a way the most important one, right? Because we can't start filling these top rings over to tower three until the bottom disk gets placed over to tower three. That should be like one of our primary concerns starting out. But where do these disks have to be in order for us to move this bottom disk? Well, they can't be here on tower one because otherwise we can't get to this thing. We can't move the bottom disc if there's junk on top of it. Likewise, these three rings here, the little or three rings can't be over here on tower three because if they are, then we can't put disc one onto tower three because there'll be stuff in the way. The only place these can go is onto tower two. So essentially what we need to do is three steps. The first step we need to do is we need to move the n minus one rings onto tower two. That's the first thing we have to do. Then we have to move the biggest ring 
to tower three. And then what we have to do is we have to move the n minus one rings over onto tower three. So step one, move this stuff over here. Step two, move the biggest ring to tower three. And then step three, move these smaller rings that are now on tower two over here onto tower three. And where the recursion comes in is we're going to do the exact same process to move these three rings as we did to move the four rings. This is getting a bit messy, but to move the three rings, what we do is we realize that, well, we want to get ring, let me clean this up a little bit. There we go. In order to move these three rings over to tower two to fulfill step one, we realize that we want to move this biggest ring of this subset of three onto tower two. And to do that, we have to move these two over to tower three. So <laughs> that's what's going to happen. These, this step here, the step one is going to be broken down recursively where we move the n minus one for this sub problem onto tower three, move the biggest ring of this sub problem onto tower two, and then move those two from three back onto two. So in doing this, we sort of have three uses for the towers. I'm going to call this one the from tower, at least for the initial version of the problem that we're looking at now. The from tower is where our biggest ring is currently at. The two tower, I'm going to call it, is where we want our biggest ring eventually to go. And I'm going to say the temporary tower, the temp tower, is the one where we're going to store the junk that's in our way of doing that moving of the biggest ring. So let's write this out in just a little more detail. I'm going to say to move in rings from tower from to tower two, we're using these sort of as variables because the way we think of the towers is going to be different for the different problems. Initially, this is the from tower and this is the two tower, but for the sub problems, when we're just looking at these rings, actually, this is going to be the two tower because those are the, that's the tower we want to get them to. So to move the end rings from the from tower to the two tower using the temp tower, this is what we're going to do. Step one, move the n minus one rings from the from tower, because that's where they currently are. They're in our way. We want to move them to the temp tower using the two tower as temporary storage. So we're sort of like swapping around the way we think of the towers in this algorithm. We begin by thinking of this as the sort of like the destination tower for the first problem, but then this becomes the destination tower. So we're keeping track of that. Then step two is to move one disk from the from tower to the two tower. Keep saying two tower or two towers makes me think of uh, Lord of the Rings, but no, that's not uh, where Sauron or Saruman live. It's just the towers in this thing. So we move one disc from the from tower to the two tower. That's going to take this one over to here in the original calling of this recursive method. But for the sub problems, it's going to move one of the smaller discs. Then step three is to move the stuff from the temporary tower where it is now over to the destination, the two tower, using the original from tower's temporary storage. So I'll say it like this. I'll say we want to move the n minus one rings from the temporary tower where they're currently at to the two tower using the from tower as the temporary place that we're storing the rings at. That's the recursive part of this. We're recursively doing stuff in step one and in step three here. Now the only thing left is the base case. The base case is going to be this. If n equals zero, then we're done. So if we don't actually have any rings to move, then we can just return out of this method. 
And that all happen when we get to the very top here. So to the very top of this, we're going to be wanting to move this ring somewhere. And we're going to say, okay, step one, move all the rings above us. Well, there aren't any, so that'll return right away. Then we move this one disk from either, uh, or rather from the two tower, either to two or three. I'm not totally sure, just looking at it, what, which one is optimal. But then we will go ahead and move all the rings above us again, but there aren't any, so it will just return. So that's where sort of the base case for this algorithm is when we try to recurse when we're at the very top ring, nothing will happen because we are going to bail out if we ever see that the number of rings is actually zero. So let's go ahead and look at some code for this. Here we have a Java method that does this, solves this problem recursively. It might be shorter than you would have thought it was. It's definitely sort of shorter than what I would have thought it would be. Sometimes recursion can almost seem like magic. It doesn't really even feel like we solved this problem. You know, this seems like a difficult problem trying to find the most optimal way to solve this little puzzle, but it turns out that using recursion, it actually makes it kind of weirdly simple. So here what we do is we have this method called move disk that takes the number of disks we're gonna move, um, our n. It takes which tower is the from tower that's where we want to move all of these disks from, the number of the tower that's the two tower, and then the number of the tower that we're using as temporary storage. Then I sort of have our base case done with this if statement. So if the number of disks to move is greater than zero, we do this stuff, otherwise we just return. So that sort of serves as the base case here. Then we have our two recursive calls. We go ahead and move the n minus one disks, from the from tower to the temporary tower using two tower as temporary storage. Then we actually move this disk. And so to do that, we just print out the message, hey, move a disk from the from tower to the two tower. And then we also keep track of the number of moves that we're doing to see if it was the optimal number or not. We just do moves plus plus every time we move a disk. And then finally, we move the n minus one disks from the temporary tower where we put them over to the two tower using the from tower as temporary storage. And all main does is it reads in from the arguments what number of disks we are using, and then it sort of kicks this off by calling the recursive method with the initial call, which is to move all of the disks, however many the user requested, from tower one as the from tower to tower three using the middle tower, tower two, as our temporary storage, and then we print out how many moves were made. So let's go ahead and compile and run this one. I can say Java C of towers, and then we'll run towers. And let's go ahead and put in our four disks like we did last time. And it found the solution in 15 moves. If you want, you can go back to the little uh, online game for the Towers of Hanoi and go ahead and follow these moves and verify yourself if you're doubtful that this is the correct solution and we'll get you the final solution of everything being on Tower 3 at the end. So this is one of those cases where this would have been much harder to solve if we were not using recursion. The recursive idea behind this is a lot simpler than any sort of loop-based idea would be. It almost, in a way, feels like cheating to use recursion here because we kind of just say like, we, on we only really did one thing. We sort of like jumped into the middle. We said, we want to move all of these things over here, you know, then we want to move this one. Then we want to move all the stuff over here to over here. And it feels like we didn't actually tell it how to move these disks, but we did because we're using the same sub process. And the way the recursion works is it works out that we use the same method for all of the different levels and it works out to solve the problem. But uh, yeah, this one this one is definitely, definitely easier with recursion. So on the notes page here, I have all of these program snippets that we looked at, including the Towers of Hanoi. And I didn't quite set the stage, but the way that the Towers of Hanoi puzzle supposedly in legend got started was that there's a story that there are these monks somewhere that have the towers and they have 64 rings on their towers and they're going to be working on moving all of the 64 rings from one tower to the other tower using this sort of method. And the legend says that when they finally finish and they move the 64th ring from tower one to tower three, the world will end. 
And the question then is, well, how many moves is that going to take them? How long will it be? And it turns out that this is one of those algorithms that just takes exponentially more number of moves as we go. If you have one ring, it only takes one move. Two rings takes three moves. As we saw, four rings takes 15 moves. We can go ahead and try it with higher numbers. Five takes 31, six takes 63, 10 takes 1,023, and so on and so forth. The more rings you do, the more time it takes. This one will take about a million moves for just 20 rings. This is going up exponentially fast. The more rings that we have as this increases, it's taking more and more and more and more number of moves. It doubles every single time we add a single ring, basically. And so, yeah, you can see this one finally finished. It took about a million moves to do just 20 rings. If I do 21 rings, it will take about 2 million moves. So as we increase, it goes up further and further and further. And if you see for 64 rings, it takes this many moves to do. And so this is a big O of two to the N algorithm. And so if the, if the legend is true, then it's going to take the monks a super duper duper long time in order to move all of these rings. So I sort of like extrapolated out on my computer for how long the program took to move rings. And if we follow sort of the pattern, it would take 17 million years to do all 64. And hopefully the monks aren't as fast as my computer, because if so, then we have a long time for the world to live before they finally finish this process. So sort of a silly story, but the uh, Towers of Hanoi is a cool example of recursion, because solving this without recursion would have been a whole lot harder. All right, that's all for this video. Thanks, and I'll see you next time for a few more examples of recursion.